at. That's right. Hey, listen, a lot of us love, love, love Sarah Palin. And let me remind you that I am one of those people that absolutely adores her. I like her because she's just like us. I think that she got a bum rap when she was running um, with McCain. But at the same time, I really feel that um, I feel it necessary to read a story that I had found. And I think that we can throw this out here for discussion today. Okay. And I think it makes for good discussion. It was uh, posted by the Keen Observer on Friday. And uh, I believe it started uh, with Pajama Media. And the, the title of the, story, uh, the uh, article is called Loose Cannons Shooting Down Palin in 2012. I'm just going to read it to you. And I would love to discuss this because, I mean, this, this man makes a lot of good points. And uh, we do want to win next presidential election. And we really got to think about who's going to get a, give us that win. I'm not saying we should settle either. But we have to think about how we're going to get that win. So anyway, the article goes on to say, in October 1988, the Willie Horton ad blew the presidential race wide open. In the months before, polls had the governor of Massachusetts, Michael Dukakis, holding a consistent 9 to 12 lead over George Bush Sr. Lee Atwater, chairman of the RNC, had been advising Bush to go negative, cease with the touchy-feely stuff, and attack Dukakis unmercifully. Atwater then crafted the controversial Horton campaign spots, predicting, quote, by the time this election is over, Willie Horton will be a household name. After stabbing a defenseless gas station attendant 19 times, Mr. Horton had been sentenced to life with no possibility of parole. But 11 years later, Governor Dukakis decided to be rehabilitative, rehabilitative granting the killer a weakened furlough. A weekend for low, but Horton never returned after yet another sadistic rampage. Horton showed up in Oxon Hill, Maryland, broke into a house, and for several hours punched, pistol whipped, and slashed the homeowner, cutting him 22 times across his midsection with a kitchen knife. When the victim's fiance showed up later that evening, Horton gagged her and savagely raped her twice. Horton then stole her car and was later chased down by police and captured. Atwater's commercial ended with a soundbite revealing Dukakis saying candidly, he heartily supported the weekend furlough program for convicted felons. Ultimately, Mike Dukakis lost by a landslide. In the 1996 election, one going away by Bill Clinton, NBC's Saturday Night Live unrelentingly ridiculed Bob Dole, portraying him as an ancient, senile, bumbling dolt, unable to maintain his balance while on stage. Oh, remember the time he tripped. In 2004, an unending series of Republican 527 ads swift-boated John Kerry to a narrow defeat versus Bush Jr. In 2008, Barack Obama ran TV spots lampooning McCain's support for taxing employee health care plans. Mr. Obama has since backtracked on his campaign pledge to not tax those very same benefits. Negative campaign ads have become a virtual bulletproof way to gain an immediate, if not decisive, advantage over one's opponent. The average voter could view 99 factual, positive ads, but standing out just before marking their ballot would be that one negative ad that they clearly recall. Exit poll surveys often reveal that undecided voters often made their decision after viewing a negative ad. Humans are oblivious to the subconscious mind and its subconsciousness that registers fear higher over every other emotion. The reason why negative strategy usually predominates over any other. In 1964, the Daisy commercial still reigns the most famous negative political ad of all time, surpassing far beyond the Democrats' wildest expectations. It featured an innocent-looking, wide-eyed little girl in a field, counting each petal as she flicked them from a big daisy. Suddenly, a harsh voiceover interjects a reverse military countdown. Five, four, three, two, one followed by stark footage of an explosion and a mushroom cloud rising from an atomic bomb. It was designed to impugn Republican Barry Goldwater as a dangerous, unstable warmonger. Americans terrified over the possibility of Goldwater's proclivity to employ nuclear weapons in the Cold War 
elected Lyndon Johnson in droves. But what if, and this is where he has some really good questions, what if negative campaign ads had been outlawed, say in some controversial five to four previous Supreme Court decision, Barry Goldwater might have won the White House in 1964. There may have been no Vietnam, nor great society, welfare programs, which have spawned a permanent minority underclass. Or what if Chevy Chase and Saturday Night Live had not cast Gerald Ford as some lumbering, clumsy oaf not to be taken seriously? There would have been no Jimmy Carter, America's worst modern president, who defeated Ford by the narrowest of margins. And if television had come to the forefront by 1948, Republican Thomas Dewey may have resoundingly defeated Harry Truman, given the fact Truman spoke in monotones and would have looked grandfatherly next to the distinguished-looking Republican governor of New York. Which leads us to an undeniable conclusion. It's not the best presidential candidate who wins, but the one who's most electable. Television is the 80,000-pound gorilla that now decides presidential elections. Picture gnarly John McCain in the three debate, debates versing, versus the glib Obama. Was McCain electable? And how about Sarah Palin, the conservative darling of the Tea Party? Is she electable? Not surprisingly, a recent Newsmax Zogby poll asked likely GOP voters if the Republican primary for president of the United States were held today, for whom would you vote? Now, this is GOP voters. Sarah Palin won handily over Mitt Romney, who finished in second place. Most notable was Scott Brown, the candidate from Central Casting, who finished down the list below Newt Gingrich and former Arkansas Governor Mike Huckabee. So there she is at the very top of that list. Mm -hmm. This is clearly good news for Palin, but an impending disaster for America. And this is where I want your all's opinion. Because I think he makes an excellent point. Sarah Palin, a disaster? The woman who would be an energetic, conservative, decisive leader? One who would be strong on defense, support our military, open up the nation's coastlines for energy exploration, who would cut taxes and prosecute the war on terror as no one ever before? So he does like her. Don't oh, get him wrong. Absolutely. I like her too. But again, is she electable, he asked. <clears throat> Excuse me. Despite her uh, talents and her magnetic charisma, she will forever be remembered for her flippant answers to Katie Couric and for the way Tina Fey cast her on Saturday Night Live. And that's the truth. Looking out for, of her front door saying, I can see Russia. Hardy har. So don't do it, Republicans. Sarah is every conservative's favorite, but who else? Pro-abortion single women, minorities, the unions, liberals, government workers, the media, how about the under-25 morons who glean their politics from Comedy Central and, of course, Saturday Night Live? Could they ever be considered pro-Palin? If Palin, although worthy, would manage to garner the GOP nomination for 2012, what then? How about Playgirl poser Levi Johnson? That's the guy who got her daughter pregnant. Mm -hmm. How many millions of dollars would the former-to-be son-in-law of Miss Palin be paid to spill the beans? Appearing on every talk show from Oprah to Letterman, Johnson would be on every tabloid cover with the caption, Sarah Palin once told me I was her secret desire. Yeah, no, it's true. They did it to her in People Magazine and Us Magazine yeah. when she was running with McCain. Johnson would be the ultimate loose cannon with his face popping up everywhere. The National Enquirer would flourish as never before. Even worse, picture Palin being swift voted by a plethora of negative campaign ads sponsored by every leftist organization from MoveOn.org to the National Foundation for Saving the Polar Bears. Just last November, a Washington Post ABC News poll reported that 52% of voters viewed Palin unfavorably versus a 76% positive rating among Republicans precisely why it's unlikely she could win in 2012. This is not to say she could never get elected president. Why not put her on um, political, ta put her political talents where she belongs in the U.S. Senate or replace the controversial Michael Steele with Sarah Palin, the de facto conscience of the nation. These are two positions where she could truly shine. Then perhaps by 2020, she would have the seasoning and the following.